good afternoon and welcome to the final session of the Presidential Task Force on Missing and Murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives virtual consultations. We really appreciate those of you who have joined us early, but we would like to um, give individuals that register to speak a few more minutes um, to join the call. We are going to start at approximately 1.40. At, during that time, you will hear silence. Um, we do appreciate your patience and we will speak with you soon. Good afternoon and welcome or good afternoon and welcome to the final session of the Presidential Task Force on Missing and Murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives Virtual Tribal Consultation. I am with Lidos, the contract support staff for the task force, and we are very pleased that you're joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. All attendees will be muted upon entry into the event. If you plan to offer oral testimony, please be sure that you've completed the following steps. Please log in and access the event via WebEx. You will need to do this either by using a telephone or, I'm sorry, a mobile device or a computer. When prompted, please enter your name the same way you entered it when you registered. And then you have two options in which to join the audio portion. You may have WebEx call you or you may call dialing in using a telephone. If you choose the option to use a telephone, please be sure to enter your attendee ID number. Um, you can find your attendee ID number, the phone number, and the event number for today when um, you join WebEx, that'll pop up. You will be called upon when it's time to offer oral testimony, and we will unmute your line at that time. If you happen to have muted your telephone, um, you will need to unmute that. There are no time limits for remarks from tribal leaders or their designees, and there is a time limit of seven to 10 minutes for others. Each speaker will be asked to identify themselves, their name, if they are speaking as a tribal leader or designee, to please state their, the name of their tribe and their title. There are a few features that I would like to direct you to that we will be using today. If you hover over the bottom center portion of your screen, you're going to see a series of radio buttons appear. We have, um, we'll be using um, the radio button that has the three dots, and the media viewer is located under that, and also the radio button that looks like the uh, conversation bubble. Today's event is being live captioned for those that are deaf or hard of hearing. If you need to use this feature, please click on the radio button with the three dots, which is where the media viewer is located, and then you can log in. If you're having any technical issues during today's event, please submit that issue to the chat box and address it to the host of today's event. Any other messages um, should be submitted to all panelists, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit, a little later in the conversation. Um, as a reminder, all phones are muted at this time. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn the consultation over to Tara Sweeney. Tara is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and she is one of the co-chairs for the task force, and she will begin today's consultation. Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Tara Sweeney, I am the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior, and welcome to our final tribal consultation. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving as Secretary of the Interior, uh, David Bernhardt, co-chair designee. I serve alongside Katie Sullivan who is the uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice. And she serves as uh, Attorney General Barr's uh, co-chair designee as well. Uh, before we begin today's consultation, I would like to take a brief moment for silent prayer. Thank you. Uh, today we have representation on the consultation 
uh, from all of the agencies who make up the Operation Lady Justice Task Force, including uh, the Department of the Interior, Office of Justice Programs, the FBI, the Office again, on Violence Against Women, uh, the BIA, Office of Justice Services, the Attorney General's Native American Issues Subcommittee, and the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Native Americans. Uh, we also have representation from the White House uh, through the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. I would like to introduce the director for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs at the White House and an advisor to President Trump, um, Mr. Doug Holscher. Doug? Uh, just about an hour ago, um, Tar and I um, we're in the Oval Office uh, with President Trump uh, for an event to commemorate, commemorate uh, the return of uh, sacred remains and important cultural artifacts from Finland back to the uh, Mesa Verde region. Um, the remains were buried on Sunday, and, and uh, so uh, it was a really moving and uh, humbling experience uh, to be there and, and the President talking about the partnership with um, several Pueblo tribes, uh, uh, but also with the Finnish government to help return those artifacts where they should have been all along. Um, in, the, in the Oval today, uh, Tara mentioned uh, the work of this task force, Operation Lady Justice, and uh, the President talked about it as well, and it's something that uh, remains on the top of all of our minds. And um, on behalf of the President, I want to thank you for your participation today uh, so we can listen and learn from, from each of you. For most of the afternoon, the floor will be yours. We're here to listen and uh, hear what you have to say on behalf of your communities, but also through your personal experiences. Uh, we'll take your experiences and suggestions into account as we continue to develop the federal government's efforts to address the issue of missing and murdered Native Americans, especially women and girls. First, I'm gonna offer just a bit of context, some background for what uh, came before this series of virtual consultations. In May of 2019, President Trump proclaimed missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives Awareness Day, becoming the first president to ever do so formally saying that, quote, ending the violence that disproportionately affects American Indian and Alaska Native communities is imperative, unquote. And the President talked about that again today. That order um, gave each of us on this call our marching orders. We on the President's team spent the next few months thinking through and talking with tribal leaders and Native American community leaders about how to develop a program of federal government action on this important issue. And last fall, just before Thanksgiving, the President hosted um, an Oval Office signing ceremony for an executive order establishing Operation Lady Justice, which is an interagency task force charged with developing an aggressive government-wide strategy to address the crisis of missing and murdered persons in Native American communities. Well, again, we're going to listen and learn from you today, but we have already taken uh, some action where there's been clear consensus. One area is on resources, and the Department of Justice, under the leadership of Attorney, Attorney General Barr, has uh, moved extra resources uh, uh, to areas that will help uh, tackle this issue set. Also is on the uh, standing up uh, of missing and murdered or Operation Lady Justice offices around the country, and the Department of Interior team is in process of doing that, and there's been some announcements um, on those offices uh, recently. Um, the session today is part of an invitation program for that order that the President signed. The President and his team remain committed to following up on that executive order with real action and concrete progress. But in the intervening months since the executive order, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic obviously has presented itself and uh, uh, really restricted travel around the country. We did, we did do some listening sessions uh, before COVID-19 hit um, uh, that were very informative and helpful, um, uh, but now we've moved these consultations uh, to a virtual format, and I think today's session is the last of the, uh, the sessions. I think we've done 11 or 12 of them around the country, and so again, I want to thank you um, to uh, 
uh, discuss this. Uh, uh, we would rather do it in person, but I think today's forum is an important uh, avenue to get your feedback. We're really grateful for the leadership of Tara and Katie Sullivan, the entire teams at Department of Justice and, and, uh, and uh, Department of Interior, but also other agencies like HHS. Jeannie uh, from uh, uh, the ACF team has been on, on uh, an important part of this effort as well. And again, we're really grateful for your presence today. Um, you have the commitment of the entire White House team as uh, we committed today by the President um, to continue to drive forward with our agency partners to make a difference on this issue informed by what we hear from you today. And with that, I'll turn it back to Tara and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And just a note of thanks uh, and appreciation for your leadership, I guess, the uh, word today is partnership, and in that spirit, we can see partnership throughout uh, the administration and through the leadership of President Trump uh, with the signing of this executive order and uh, the support for HHS, the uh, administration for Native Americans uh, through DOJ and DOI. And so I certainly appreciate uh, the support that we continue to receive from the White House for Indian Country as demonstrated by the repatriation of uh, the remains that are culturally significant to the tribes associated with the Mesa Verde region. Uh, as, as many know, uh, when you read the task force, uh, the executive order uh, spells out that the task force must consult with tribes on the scope and nature of the issues regarding missing or murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives. And as Doug said, we held a series of in-person consultations and listening sessions uh, across the country. We were able to do five in-person listening sessions in February and early March before the current health crisis. And we held an additional four virtual listening sessions at the end of May, around the beginning of June. Uh, and as a result of uh, the COVID pandemic and the current situation we all find ourselves in, uh, we are holding our uh, tribal consultations virtually. Uh, they have been organized by BIA region, and today marks the final session reserved for those who could not make it to their uh, scheduled session. Uh, a Dear Tribal Leader letter and framing paper were distributed on July 17 and again on July 11. In addition, uh, this series of virtual consultations has been widely publicized across uh, the country. What you see or should see on the WebEx uh, is a slide that uh, illustrates the types of questions that have been posed uh, through the Dear Tribal Leader letter. Uh, or um, the, the questions that, that we uh, would like to receive input on from uh, Indian Country and Alaska Native communities to help guide our discussions. And so uh, the questions center around uh, four areas that encourage discussion about the issues in your communities. Uh, basically, what, what please help us identify the scope of uh, the problems of missing or murdered uh, community members, and what are the challenges that your communities face? Uh, what solutions or resources do you have, or what solutions or resources are needed? And uh, finally, what specific recommendations do you have to address or curtail the incidents of missing persons or murdered cases within our Native communities. And so with that, uh, I want to just underscore what, what Doug said. We're here to listen and to learn. And I will turn it over now to Lidos to call on the registered speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are going to start the testimony portion. Um, as noted on the registration, um, during the registration process, you must be registered in order to speak um, during today's consultation. 
We are going to hear from the tribal leaders and their designees who have registered to speak today. And as a reminder, there are no time limits for the leaders or designees. Um, please note that our registration list is current as of 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. If you registered after this time, we may not know that you registered to speak, so you'll need to let us know that you are on the call. You can do that by submitting your name and information in the chat box and addressing it to all panelists. We currently have six tribal leaders. I'm going to read their names. If you do not hear your name called, please then submit a message to chat again to all panelists. Um, we have Estelle Thompson, Deborah Maytubi, Earthfire Sovereign, Shirley Sam, Judge Frank Damali, and Gloria Simeon. So if you do not hear your name called, please again submit um, a chat to all panelists letting us know that you did register after 1130 and you would like to offer testimony as a tribal leader or a tribal designee. At this time, we're going to start with our first speaker, and that is Estelle Thompson. Estelle, we are going to unmute your line. I will let you know once that has been completed. You can begin your testimony. Please restate your name, whether you are speaking as a tribal leader or a designee, um, and the name of your tribe. Estelle, your line has been muted. You been, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Hello. Thank you. Um, my name is Estelle Thompson. My Yupi calling name is Angutukaha. It means I am the one who will provide. I am from a southwest, the southwestern Bering Sea Coast village of um, Bimutes. It's actually um, a displaced village, so we do not live in our ancestral lands. I grew up in the village of Hooper Bay, which is very close by. Um, we have intermarried and become parts of other communities in three villages that neighbor our ancestral lands, Hooper Bay, Scammon Bay, and Chivac. And currently, I am the Tribal Court Program Director for my village, the native village of Paimute. I also serve on our traditional council um, as an officer. I'm an enrolled tribal member and a descendant of one of the original five families of my ancestral lands. Um, I come to you today um, for several reasons. Um, as a tribal leader, it's my responsibility to speak up for things that speak up and advocate for things that are not being addressed within my community um, or my region for that matter. Um, here in the state of Alaska, um, we've experienced an, an incredible amount of um, violence against women, whether that be domestic violence, sexual assault, um, sex trafficking, any of the things that you are here to listen to us today. When I looked at the letter for the consultation and seeing your objectives of enhancing the safety of American Indian and Alaska Native women from domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and, and sex trafficking, as well as strengthening the response and um, being able to administer funds to help us to take care of our people. Um, I was heartened, but also very disappointed. On the same day that we received the letter from your organization to um, to speak at this tribal consultation, I also received a letter from the acting director for the uh, for OBW stating my village was ineligible for even applying because we don't have jurisdiction over our lands. Um, we have an unusual situation in my in my instance because. We have um, agreements with with our other villages. We actually have an intertribal consortium for tribal justice and public safety between my village and Hooper Bay, where we live. Um, so I, we had every we had every um, we had every option, to, and we do have jurisdiction over Indian country. Um, one of the things that was really troublesome for me is seeing um, the words that um, the uh, Office of Violence Against Women and the Department of Justice when it comes to um, working with Alaska Natives and American Indians and the issues that we have in our villages is the words are great, but if we can't, if we can't rely on you to live up to your, your statement that you're going to be doing everything that you can to help us, um, putting up barriers because we are displaced is, is a little bit ridiculous. Um, 
I've given testimony in Bethel. I've given testimony in D.C. Um, I was sent last spring to Washington, D.C., actually right before um, Anchorage went on lockdown, and I gave testimony there. And I feel a little bit like a broken record in the, in the sense that I repeat the same statistics over and over again. Um, for those of you that are not from Alaska, um, in 2016, the Federal Bureau of Investigations named Alaska the most dangerous state in the U.S. So we have this distinction of having the highest per capita violent crime in the nation, um, especially in, in relation to domestic violence and sexual assault. The region of Alaska that I come from, um, one of two women um, in our population in our communities reports having um, experienced sexual assault, domestic violence, or both during their lifetime, and those are just the folks that um, report, those are just the women that report. Um, so much so that um, we did have a very strong um, representation um, in Bethel at our, our uh, community testimony. Um, a lot of the testimony that we had given actually encouraged Senator Lisa Murkowski to introduce a Senate bill, um, 2016. Um, that's currently stuck in, in um, limbo in Congress. The, the bill is the Alaska Tribal Public Safety Empowerment Act. And it was sponsored by Senator Murkowski, but the, the testimony, the community testimony from all over Alaska was included in, in crafting that bill. And there were so many recommendations from um, all of our people. Uh, we were facing the same issues. We, we lack money. We lack um, the, the kinds of um, partnerships that we need. Um, it, I don't know if you know how difficult it is to work with our law enforcement, um, but it can be extremely challenging. Um, in our villages, um, especially in my region, only 8% of the communities in my region, the Yukon Cuscoquim region, have village public safety officers. And that's not for lack of trying. We actually um, have applied to, to get some of our people trained. Um, the village that we are partnered with, Hooper Bay, they have six um, public safety officers. And only two of those people up until just recently had received any sort of training from um, any organization that would train them to be officers. And that was over the course of two years. So two out of six in two years, um, that's how infrequently our people get trained. Um, when I started the consortium with my village and theirs, um, it was imperative to me that training was at the very top of our list. And that's something that we are pursuing aggressively for our people. Um, other statistics related to public safety in my area include um, Alaska State Troopers. So this information was taken a few years ago um, from a, um, some research they were doing into um, how, many, how many troopers serve our area. Um, well, throughout the state of Alaska, the Alaska State Troopers employ 57 commissioned troopers and three command staff officers in the sea detachment, that's for my region. Um, they're called on to serve an estimated 43,242 people. As, uh, and these are people that rely on the Alaska State Troopers as their primary provider of public safety. So that, that boils it down to one trooper for seven, every 758 residents. And each trooper covers approximately 3,791 square miles of area. Um, the Yukon Cluster Delta uh, is an area that is larger than the state of Alabama. So you can imagine one, one trooper for every 758 people within that area. Um, there are trooper posts in our communities of Bethel, Hooper Bay, Imanic, St. Mary's, and Antioch. And, um, Obviously, this is is not enough. I mean, just the weather alone, it creates logistical issues. Sometimes the troopers cannot get to some of our villages because of weather um, or distance, or they may be elsewhere. So 
just keeping those things in mind. Um, you can understand my frustration um, not being able to be granted uh, funding to help our people. Um, some other things. Um, according to Senator Murkowski and the Indian Law and Com Order Commission in the Alaska Tribal Public Safety Empowerment Act, um, it re reiterates over, and I mean, this is something that's been reiterated over and over again, that Alaska Native women are overrepresented in the domestic violence population by 250% and are 47% of the reported rape victims in the state of Alaska. Um, the one thing that I tried to <laughs> tried to inform um, the OVW office and Laura Rogers was that regardless of our land title, the Indian tribes or native tribes in Alaska have inherent civil and criminal jurisdiction over the Alaska natives present in their villages, and we have full civil jurisdiction in our villages to enforce protection for any individual. Um, I don't know how many other villages are displaced like mine, I don't know how many other villages experience the same type of discrimination as mine have over the years, and it's not just through this organization. Um, it's taken a long time to repair and rebuild relationships between us and other villages, uh, between us and the state of Alaska, between us and, and various agencies. We understand that we, as Alaska Natives villages, we're not like the tribes in the lower 48. Um, our people are not like, relegated to the confines and the borders of a reservation, but we are federally recognized. And as such, we have the same um, legal relationship between the United States and to the indigenous people. Um, the U.S. has a federal trust responsibility to all of us and to our tribal governments to safeguard our people. Um, and it should be applicable whether that is in a reservation in the lower 48 or in one of our villages in Alaska. I have to take a break for a second. <clears throat> um, as a federally recognized tribe, we're, uh, the U.S. is supposed to recognize our sovereign status. And just because our people live in a remote village, it doesn't disqualify us as people of the land, and it shouldn't disqualify us from being afforded the same protections and benefits of tribes in the lower 48. Um, you can see some of the breakdown of the communication, the relationships between um, the native villages and members of communities and um, law enforcement. Um, a primary example, a good, good example right now would be the uh, Florence Okpialo can make uh, in Nome right now. Um, she's been missing for two weeks, and um, I've heard testimony not just once, but a couple different times from various people that live in the community. And um, law enforcement was not working with them. So, in my mind, we have several different problems. Yes, we need more funding um, for our communities. Yes, we need to have um, very clear understanding of our needs and our desires as for being able to provide the resources for the protection of our people. But we also need to make sure that our local or municipal or state law enforcement understands that we do have this, this right and authority on our lands. And we also need to be taken seriously. Um, as much as I love my state, I do know our law enforcement has has problems in, in dealing with um, Alaska Natives and other minority peoples. Um, there's a lot of things that have been coming up in the past few months regarding the relationships between communities and law enforcement, not just in our state, but across the country. And those, those types of relationships or the breakdowns of those relationships um, and the inherent racism that is, that is embedded into our, our law enforcement organizations, um, they can be illustrated in other people, not just Alaska Natives. Think about like Breonna Taylor or uh, George Floyd. I could name a whole bunch of other people. Um, there are indigenous Americans who have experienced the same type of thing. But what, what I really just wanted to say today is that 
Um, I appreciate the opportunity that you've given us to speak. I appreciate the opportunities you are giving our tribes and our tribal governments to access more funds. But if, if you are going to do that, you cannot be discriminatory about a tribe that maybe doesn't live in their ancestral lands or are not, um, are not in an area where it seems like they have jurisdiction. According to the U.S. Code 1154 and 1156, Indian country is defined to be all land within the limits of any Indian reservation under the jurisdiction of the U.S. government, um, and it keeps going on, um, all dependent Indian communities within the borders of the United States, whether they are within the original or subsequently acquired territory thereof or within the limits of a state, and all Indian allotments and the Indian titles that have been have not been extinguished. So I would like to make sure that as you come together after meeting with all of us and hearing us today and over the course of each of the, um, the consultations, um, I've been fortunate enough to listen to a number of them um, up until now. Um, I would like to make sure that you remember that your actions meet your word. They follow your word. Yes, we'll help you. Yes, we understand that, that Alaska has challenges unlike any other state within the United States. Our villages are different and our, the logistics of dealing with law enforcement within our communities are different. If you really want to encourage and support our villages, our tribal governments, our municipal governments in ensuring that we have protections for our people, it will go a long way in meeting the goals that you have to enhance the safety of our women from those different types of crimes against us. And it's not something that is, is um, unknown to many of us that may be even on the lines right now. I actually am speaking as a survivor of domestic violence and rape. So I understand just how significant my voice can be to you. I think one of the most important things that, that I can possibly say is that I am imploring you not to just discuss this with your team, but to come up with action items that really will help us. And look at your policies to make sure that you're not discriminating against people or tribes that have unusual circumstances like mine. Because of the, the criteria, we were considered ineligible to apply for, for the funding. And um, it was just heartbreaking. Um, I'm the only person that writes the grants for my village and for um, Hooper Bay's public safety. They don't have anybody on their team that can do that. Um, creating these um, consortiums, creating these, these partnerships between other tribes, municipal governments, and um, our tribal justice and state justice agencies is so important for us. We've been working very, very diligently at it. There are a number of tribal courts and villages within the state of Alaska that are working toward this goal of having a unified front to fight these things. Thank you for your time. I really don't want to take too much time away from any of the other um, people that are, are speaking today. But I mean, you can Thank tell you. this is something that's very, pa I'm very passionate about and I'm very, I will constantly advocate for. So please, um, please take that back with you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Estelle. Um, our next um, individual that's going to offer testimony is Earth Feather Sovereign. 
Um, we will go ahead and unmute your line um, at that time. Please restate your name, whether you are speaking as a tribal leader or designee, as well as the name of your tribe. And your line is unmuted. You may begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Earth Feather Sovereign. I am a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes located here in the, in the state of Washington. Um, I'm Okanagan San Paul and the Spielen Bands. My father is Ernest Clark and my mother is Deanna Marcelli. I am a descendant of chiefs and matriarchs, including La Pizza, first known contact with Lewis and Clark here in the Pacific Northwest. I am inspired by my ancestors to continue to advocate for our people, all indigenous people, and all inhabitants of our Mother Earth because we are all related and everything is connected. I am here as the founder, director, and advocate for missing and murdered indigenous women in Washington. The numbers I'm sharing with you are collected in small quantities, and there is no comprehensive database on violence against Native women under tribal jurisdiction because no federal or tribal agency systematically collects this data. Data collecting is also complicated because of under-reporting by state, city, tribal, and federal authorities. In Washington State, we have 29 tribes. We have the most tribes in one state as compared to any other state. Yakima Nation and Colville Nation are our two largest res reservations with about 10,000 tribal members with each reservation. 72% live on urban areas, indigenous people from all over our continent live off um, reservations. In 2019, the National Crime Center reported 609,275 missing people in general, 311,008 were missing men of all races, 298,190 are women of all races. Native Americans make up 2% of the population. 10,447 American Indian people are missing. And in 2016, we had the numbers of 5,712 were missing Native American women, and today we still believe that number is um, above 5,000. And only 116 were logged into the Department of Justice database. 2018, Washington State, Washington State Patrol reported in an HB 2951 consultation 634 open cases of missing people in Washington State and 98 open cases of missing and murdered indigenous women, not including our men, children, or our, our LGBTQ, which we refer to as two-spirit. The Urban Indian Health Institute Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Study, Washington State ranks number two with the most missing and murdered indigenous women in our nation as compared to cities, um, Seattle is ranked as number one. In Seattle, another Urban Indian Health Institute reported by Abigail Echo Hawk, 94% have been raped in their lifetime, and only 8% ended in a conviction. Most domestic violence and sexual assaults are perpetrated by non-tribal members. Some of these attacks end in murder. And I would like to know where is our cold case center? Gina Mossbrooker and I initiated two missing and murdered indigenous women bills for Washington State. February 1st, 2018, HB 2951 passed last. The bill directed Washington State Patrol to work with Governor Office of Indian Affairs to work with local tribes and urban organizations to help come up with better systems on collecting and reporting missing indigenous women in Washington State. July 28, 2019, HB 1713 passed and was in effect. This bill created two tribal liaisons to work under the state patrol and to work with 29 tribes and urban organizations. The liaisons are directed to come up with protocols to help direct 
law enforcement when making a missing persons report. And the bill started out as a 20 plus person task force, but there wasn't enough funding. In 1992, I was stolen by a gang in Portland, Oregon, who wanted to traffic me in Hawaii, but due to my family searching for me, because law enforcement said they had to wait 48 critical hours. And if my family were not, would have been idle, I wouldn't be here today. Also in 2004, I was strangled by my husband. And if it wasn't for family searching for me and pulling him off me, I wouldn't be here today. Law enforcement didn't always want to act on arresting him. Now I have a lifetime protection order against him to protect myself and my children. The issues and recommendations um, that I've discovered was law enforcement of all jurisdictions, as well as supportive urban organizations have reported that there's not enough funding to investigate cold cases after 10 years. And I believe the government state and city should also hire Native Americans because only us as Native American Indian people know um, what it is to be Native American and know all the barriers and know all the struggles that we have to um, tackle as Native American people. And tribal police cannot investigate off reservations and we need to be able to get the tribal police recognized as an official police department with each state so they can help search for their people and the funding needs to follow tribal members. And tribes need to reclaim their sovereignty to create missing and murdered indigenous person boards to, to oversee and assist Operation Lady Justice or any state or federal agency helping us find or seek justice for our people. And I believe our indigenous, indigenous Native American women are at the bottom of our nation's totem pole because we have the highest statistics. When you help tackle our issues, it can create a bubble effect and it, it can help everyone's issues. This is not just a tribal issue, it's an American issue because everyone has a right to healthy food clean air, clean water, and everyone has a right to walk this earth free from harm and feel safe. So we would like better government to government relationships with respect of our American Indian First Nations indigenous people with proper protocols and better relationships. So together, let's make America safe again. Lim Lim, thank you. Hi, does that conclude your testimony? If you could just please, please confirm. Yes, that concludes Thank you my... very much. Sorry, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, the next person that we are going to call upon to offer testimony will be Judge Frank Damali. Judge Damali, we are going to unmute your line. Please restate your name, whether you are speaking as a tribal leader or designee, um, and the name of your tribe. Give us one second, please, so we can get your name listed. Judge Damali, we have three lines for you. We did unmute one. Um, can you try speaking? All right, Judge Damali, um, we do have one of the lines unmuted. Um, if your telephone is muted or your computer, can you please try to unmute that? We are also going to unmute um, some of the caller lines to see if um, you are listed under one of them. Give us one moment, please. We have quite a few of... Can you hear me? Judge DeMolly, is that you? Yes, it is. Okay, we hear you. We actually hear two, two lines. I think this is you. Go ahead and try again. Very well. My name is Frank DeMolly. I am a designee for Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss the uh, Operation Lady Justice Initiative. I've been general counsel and judge at various northern pueblos for 25 years. And I've listened to the testimony uh, during a previous call and today. 
while we don't in the in Santa Clara Pueblo have the extensive problem with missing uh, women and murdered women, what we do have is a proactive approach. And what I want to focus on in my testimony is the programs that we need to um, to help us, and I think to help all the other tribes. We urge expansion of the tribal access program because this provides computer hardware and software so we can access a number of databases when we're doing investigations. Now, let me be specific. We're close to the New Mexico border. At other tribes that I have represented, other Pueblos, one of the problems we had was with missing women who we assumed were being taken to Mexico. We need good relations with Mexico so that we can ask their people to either bring back or work with the tribes on bringing back their people, uh, the Pueblo's people, and these are Pueblo enrolled members. We recommend the strengthening of the Federal Special Law Enforcement Commissioning Program because this allows tribal police officers to enforce all laws involving Pueblo victims. The SLAC program is superb, and if we could strengthen that, I think it would help all tribes. Now, I said that we were being proactive. We have found that a lot of times when there is a person missing from the Pueblo, their intimate partner may be the reason that they've left the Pueblo. I want to commend everyone for the Violence Against Women Act, which allows for the protection of women when the perpetrator is non-native. The Pueblo needs a way to have justice done and have the outside world know that if you, um, as a non-native, are coming on the Pueblo and committing domestic violence and or kidnapping women from the Pueblo, that the Pueblo will be on the forefront of providing justice. So last month, Santa Clara Pueblo was approved for Violence Against Women Act um, the SDVCJ code, and to be able to enforce domestic violence laws against people who are non-natives, but they affect the women on the Pueblo. Um, we'll provide a written response to other task force questions, and for whatever it's worth, it makes you cry if you were to judge and see these cases and know that there's resources out there if we can just access them. So please, on the TAP program, do your best to get those out to as many of us as you can. And it also makes you cry to hear from Alaska and Washington with their enormous problems. That concludes my testimony. The rest will be written. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Judge Tamale. Um, our next speaker is going to be Shir Shirley Sam. Shirley, um, we will give us a second to unmute your line. Um, once we do that, please restate your name. Indicate if you are speaking in, as a tribal leader or a designee, and then the name of your tribe. This is Shirley Sam Shirley, speaking as a designee for the Kaikuk Native Village. Thank you very much. You may begin. Okay, um, Kaikuk is a small village in Alaska. Its population is 86, and roughly 376 tribal members. A large amount of our tribal members live in the cities like Fairbanks and Anchorage. And um, regarding 
missing person cases. There has been reports of both male and females who have gone missing. And um, they're usually people who travel to the city for medical or other appointments. And um, sometimes when they get their evidence or money from firefighting, they'll go into Fairbanks or Anchorage, too. And Kaikuk is a long distance from the nearest cities. It's over 370 miles away, and it's, Kaikuk is only accessible by air. When a person is mis reported missing, the tribe is not notified. The tribe is not invited in the search. The law enforcement agencies will only offer a limited time to search, and it is usually the responsibility of the people in the area to continue the search on using their own resources. There is a need for a designated tribal point of contact that law enforcement officers can contact in the event of a report of a missing person. There is a need for people and money in the area to assist with the search. A lot of times families won't, family won't leave the area where search is being made and um, food and drinks and, you know, snacks is the responsibility of the family who's searching. People chip in, but um, during the course of long searches, it, it, you know, the resources, local resources from the people, it gets depleted. There is a need for this type of money to be made available so that we can search for our missing people. There is also a need for money for a point of contact to travel to a location of a missing person to coordinate with the local law enforcement agencies and to keep updated on the missing person case. In the past, when there was a report of a missing person no one from my village was able to go because it was so far away. It was in Anchorage. That's over 500 miles from our village. And there was no money. And the only contact we had um, was through a Facebook page that family could keep us updated of anything. And it was really sad. It was really, really sad trying to sit home not being able to go help and, you know, with delayed information and so there really is a need for funding for that type of situations. And regarding murder cases, that um, are located outside of Kaikuk. They were male, and as you you know, they usually travel to city for appointments or, you know, when they get large amounts of money. And when a person was murdered, the family was notified and no information was given to the tribe regarding the investigation or the progress on the case. There were no updates given a list of family calls and pressures to law enforcement agency for information. There really is a need for a tribal point of contact to be designated to receive updates and communicate with law enforcement officers. There is a need for funding for family members to travel to claim body and escort the body home for the funeral and for the point of contact to travel with them to assure that all traditional and customs are adhered to. And, you know, it's really important that um, traditional ways of doing things be recognized by the law enforcement agencies. You know, we understand about autopsies. We know they have to be conducted for, you know, evidence and the data. You know, we understand that. But every possible respect should be given to a person who is murdered. And that's from our tribe. 
especially if we're not able to be there. You know, and, you know, statewide and even on the regional level in Alaska, we need communication and coordination when reports are made of a missing or murdered Alaska Native so that local resources can be called up in the area and see what further assistance is needed to help to search or locate witnesses. It would be ideal for a task force to be made available at, a re at each region that deals specifically with Alaska Natives involved with crimes and that law enforcement will then coordinate with the village on the cases. You know, the rural unit out of Fairbanks does not coordinate with tribes on what the status is on cold cases that involve missing or murdered Alaska Natives. Those people that were murdered, we, they, no one was ever brought to justice. We don't even know the status of those cold cases. No one tells us these things, you know. I mean, at the tribe, no one, no one is notified, you know. If there is some kind of database that, you know, we can check, you know, for cold cases, that would be great, you know. I mean, it's just really sad. It's really sad. It's, it's just so important that cold cases be looked at again. No matter the amount of time that passed, they're still important. We still miss them. We still love them. And we don't feel closure knowing that these cold cases are still there. And no one's doing anything about it. We need more power as a tribe to be able to do something for these cold cases, to get them looked at again, even, the, you know, maybe somebody's conscience is weighing, is weighing on them and they want to, you know, they, maybe they want to confess, but they, w they couldn't, you know. I think these cases should be looked at again. It's been too many years. I'll, I have um, written testimony that I'll be submitting to go along with this oral testimony. And I, I thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, at this time, we are going to open up some of the caller lines to see if we can identify the last two tribal leaders that um, registered to speak. Um, we are looking for Deborah um, Maytubi as well as Gloria Simeon. So. Um, Deborah and Gloria, give us a moment to unmute the call lines, and then we will call out your name again. If you are on the line, you can begin your testimony. So one minute, please. We're having a little bit of technical slowness here, so be, please be patient. All right, Deb, all the lines have been unmuted. Deborah Matubi, Matubi um, and Gloria Simeon. If you are on the call, please, um, you may begin your testimony, restate your name, if you are speaking as a tribal leader or designee, um, as well as the name of your tribe. Deborah and Gloria. Freeze. Hello, was that Deborah or Gloria? All right, we are going to mute the lines again, and we are going to go, that would finish us up with our tribal leaders. Um, who registered to speak, and we are going to go to the other individuals that have registered to speak at this time. As we noted on the registration form, you do need to be registered to speak and offer testimony in order to participate. There is a seven to ten minute limit on testimony from individuals other than tribal leaders. And we have a registration list which is um, up to date as of 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. If you register to offer testimony after that time, um, we ask that you please submit um, your name and information to the chat box and address it to all panelists, um, and then we can um, add you to the list. I'm going to read out a list of names of all the individuals that have registered to offer testimony. If you do not hear your name mentioned, then please submit that information to the chat box, again, addressing it to all panelists. 
So give me one moment and we can start that. We have Sissy Strong, Sissy Strong, Desiree Rohad, Josie Tener um, Tenorio, Latara Russell, Tara Pretend Eagle Weber, Jennifer Burskin Delia, Grace Bultel, Bultel, Roxanne White, Anna Bean, Kalia Lawrence, Benita Moore, Rachel Fernandez, Cal Taylor Lucas, Felicia Laika, Billy Miller, and Carolyn DeFord. Again, if you did not hear your name mentioned, please submit that information to the chat box, addressing it to all, uh, all panelists, please, I'm sorry, addressing it to all panelists, and then we will add you to the list. We will start um, calling the speakers who we are able to identify, and that will start with Grace Bulltail. Grace, we will under, um, sorry, we will unmute your line. After we do that, please restate your name, um, provide your title, as well as the name of your tribe. Grace, Grace, your line is unmuted, muted, excuse me, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Grace Bulltail. I'm from the Crow tribe, also a descendant of the three affiliated tribes. And I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I want to speak to you today about my niece, Kaysara Stops Pretty Places. I help my grandparents raise Kaysara, and I consider her to be my daughter. Kaysara is Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikara tribes. She was beloved by her large extended family and she was a kind, loving, and compassionate soul. One year ago today, we were having a funeral service for Kay Sarah. She was laid to rest 24 days after she went missing and 19 days after her body was found. I've stated the heartbreaking details about Kay Sarah's disappearance in the Montana border town of Hardin with this forum previously. It has been a month since Kaysara should have been celebrating her 19th birthday. Instead of today marking a year since she was laid to rest, we were not able to give Kaysara a proper burial. After everything the coroner and the funeral director subjected Kaysara's body to and to the information that the coroner and law enforcement withheld from my family. My family, along with others, are devastated and we should not have to confront the indignities our girls still face in death that are the result of little value that is placed on their lives. When this listening session for Montana region was held on August 25th, a few weeks ago, I was at the location where Kaysera's body was found in Hardin. I remained there in protest until August 29th to mark a year since her body was found. At no point did Bighorn County law enforcement come to speak to me. During that time, I also tried to join a listening session on that day, but I was unable to do so because I did not have a wireless, wireless internet connection. So this is why I'm joining today. I'm saddened to think about the other families who have been able to join these sessions because they lack the access to the internet as many families in Indian country do. We all need you to do better. Despite my family's efforts, Kaysara's case is now considered a cold case because it has been a year since she was found deceased. Will you be able to help her now? We've held Justice for Kaysara events for 19 days from August 24th to September 11th to mark the time she was stolen from us and no one had the decency and humanity to notify us that she had been found. As part of our efforts, we address this task force. Will our calls for justice continue to go unheard? Uh, since I'm not aware of the time, I'm allowed to speak until I actually join the meeting. Here are some of the gaps 
in receiving justice my family has identified. As, as stated in our letter to Attorney General Fox of Montana, who oversees the justice system. So in my letter to Attorney General Fox, I say, my family has sent letters to you, to you several times since September 2019 when we were notified of Kisara's death. A year after Kisara, Kisara's body was found in Hardin, you have yet to engage in any way with my family. As you are from Hardin in Bighorn County, you should be familiar with the high number of missing and murdered Indigenous women in that county. The county has the greatest rate of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in the state and nation. It is appalling that you ignore my family that has reached out to you more times than we should have to. As Kaysera was found in Hardin off the reservation, her death is within the jurisdiction of Bighorn County. The state of Montana, your office, is charged with upholding the law for crimes committed off the reservation. There is no reason you cannot address my family directly as Kaysera's murder is in with within the jurisdiction of your office. The justice system in Bighorn County in Montana has failed Kisera in all aspects of investigating her death. Will your office continue to be complicit in allowing this to happen? My family has asked for the Montana Department of Criminal Investigation to step in and investigate Kisera's murder. The response from your office has been that the county must request for the Montana DCI to assist with the investigation. This is a complete dismissal of a grieving family that is pleading with the justice system to ensure that the murder of their teenage daughter is adequately investigated. And when the Bighorn County attorney did request assistance from the Montana DCI, your office's response was that you are not able to uphold your responsibilities due to the current caseload. Is this standard practice to pick and choose which cases receive adequate investigation based on how much criticism your office receives? How is this fulfilling your duties to uphold justice in the state for all cases that are referred to your office for further investigation? Ensuring some initiative to address the long neglected MMIWG crisis in your state you have created the Montana Missing Indigenous Persons Task Force last year. What are your plans to address the murder of Indigenous people, particularly women and girls that occur at the highest rates in the country? So here is a suggestion. You can start by making all MMIWG cases a priority for receiving assistance when directed through the channels as laid out by your office. I'm attaching a letter I sent the Bighorn County Sheriff Big Hair. In this letter, I mentioned the residence where Kaysera was last seen alive on August 24th, 2019. You, Attorney General Fox, should be very familiar with the family that lives at this residence, as they had ceremonially, ceremonially adopted you into their family in the Crow tribe. The significance of this information is not lost on me. I demand that you and your capacity as Attorney General respond to and assist my family. If you have the bandwidth to run for governor while serving as Attorney General, you can help Kaysera's family while you are still in office. So this is a, a letter I sent to the Attorney General um, as well as several other candidates that are running for office in Montana uh, that continue do not address the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and people in our state. As you can see, we have exhausted all possible venues to ask for assistance. Will you also continue to de deny Kaysera justice? I'm sorry, does that conclude your testimony? Yes. Thank you very much for that. Um, our next um, speaker is going to be Atara Russell. Atara. Um, we will unmute your line. I will let you know when that is done. Please restate your name as well um, as your title and the name of your tribe. Your Thank line you. has been unmuted. You may begin. Thank you for having and listening to me. My name is Otaira Russell, and um, I am a 
descendant of the Aleut tribe in Alaska, although I live in Washington State. I'm coming to you today as a family member of a missing and murdered um, indigenous family, and I'm speaking on behalf of my own family today. Um, I just wanted to bring to the attention, as everyone else has said, that there is a lack of funding, and some of the things that I feel like um, would benefit us are regional community resource centers. Um, people don't understand the tragedy that us families have to deal with when one disappears. My niece, Alyssa McLemore, disappeared in April 2009. So this is our 11th year um, without Alyssa. And it's hard. We spent the first eight years, eight and a half years by ourselves with little um, little resources to come up with even flyers to put out to look for Alyssa. Um, the police department has their investigation, so they can't tell us much. But um, a few things that bothered me that I'd also like to see corrected is when Alyssa came up missing, Alyssa was listed as Asian. And to have her nationality corrected was a lot of work. Her just her simply nationality was not corrected until just two years ago. Um, and the only person that could correct that was the, per, the police department responsible for her case. Um, the other thing is that when Alyssa first disappeared, there was a DNA profile set up that was supposed to be entered into the system. And um, nine years went by before we figured out Alyssa's DNA was improperly entered into this system. So I feel like my family fell through the gaps the first nine years um, just for having support with, from the community, from anybody within um, law enforcement reaching out to us. There was no advocates um, and things like that until we hooked up with some other people, Roxanne White and Carolyn DeFord and, you know, a couple of local tribes have been helping us. But it was a long eight years, you know, and I feel like a lot more could have been done, particularly if her DNA was entered properly. Now they say it is, but how can we really trust that? If a body happened to be found seven years ago and Alyssa's DNA wasn't entered right and they actually found Alyssa, she could be an unclaimed body somewhere. Um and the stress that that puts on our family, every time you hear um, a person is missing, your whole world comes to a stop until you figure out if it's a lady or if it's a man. And overall, this is just causing generational trauma for my family. My oldest family member is 86 years old. The youngest one that's able to understand is six years old. They're watching each other hurt and not have any resources. There's no family counseling for us. There's no um, no resource center where we can just say, you know, I'm having a hard day today. You know, we have to wait for certain events to get coordinated and put together and then hope that we can have the funding to make it there. When it comes to even searching for Alyssa, you know, we have to do this mostly on our own. And even if we find something, our local law enforcement, like now, there's a well. My local law enforcement will not go down and look at this well, although it has a tarp over it, and it could be a body under there. It could not be. But nonetheless, it's still a public safety. Any A kid could fall in there or a dog. Um, you know, so I just feel like once a person becomes a missing case and they've been gone for quite some time, it becomes irrelevant to law enforcement. And I would like to know who who – considers people a cold case. How long does that process take before you're actually a cold case? And for the law enforcement that's not helping us, um, how would you feel being told that your family member that you love and have been searching for is a cold case now and they don't have any funding to help you any longer? I mean, that causes depression. We're already in an epidemic. We're already the lower class as far as incomes are concerned. We already have the highest number. Um, of people coming up missing, and it's just, there's a lot more that could be done, and I won't take a lot of your time, but I think regional community resource centers with real help um, to serve our needs would be one of the great um, things that would benefit us to close the gap on the DNA process, 
of it being collected. We need somebody to make sure that it's followed through and properly entered. Um, even having a resource person that would um, contact the coroner for the families. I had to contact every coroner by myself every time that there's a female body found within Washington State. And, you know, that's depressing. And there's no counseling for me while I'm campaigning my niece's thing. Her mother's deceased. The camp police considered her um, a cold case. So there's nobody looking for her. If I give up now, who's going to look for her? Does she just not count anymore? I mean, so I would just like to see some of these things addressed. Um, in, in these resource centers, I would like to see funding for search parties and volunteers for search parties and just other ways that the families can really feel like they're being heard and even somebody to follow up because we don't know who designates the task force and the advocates. It seems like we don't even have a say or a vote. So, um, you know, I just think that there's a lot of things, a lot of gaps that need to be filled. And even with the Washington State Patrol website, I'll just stop after I finish with this, but the Washington State Patrol website, the Washington State Patrol has been well aware that my niece is missing to the point where they helped us get a truck for my niece. But no one at Washington State Patrol has taken this time after 11 years to put my niece on their website for missing peoples. I think it's ridiculous that that's one more thing the family has to do when the law enforcement can't communicate with the, within each other and say, hey, we have another missing person and put that person on a list or on the internet without the families having to do that. Just, it's a simple step. But um, the rest of my comments will be submitted in writing, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me and my concerns. That ends my testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is going to be Kalina Lawrence. Kalina, we will unmute your line. I will let you know when that has been done. Please restate your name, um, your title, as well as your tribal, um, the name of your tribe. Give us one second, please. Your line has been unmuted. You may begin your testimony. Kalina Lawrence, my name is Kalina Lawrence. I am Suquamish. I come from the place of the clear salt water. Um, I was born and raised on the Port Madison Indian Reservation in Suquamish, Washington. I am 27 years old. I am here today as an individual. I do not represent the Suquamish tribal government. Um, I am speaking as a young woman who was raised in Suquamish uh, culture and in a culture of continued assimilation at the enforcement of the U.S. government and settler colonialism. I currently live in the ancestral village of Yalamu, which is stolen Ramaytush territory, um, the city of San Francisco and the state of California in all of its history of genocide and theft also committed by the United States government and settler colonialism. I've lived here in San Francisco for six years, constantly traveling back and forth to my home territory, Coast Salish territory, um, and utilizing my lived experiences as a young indigenous woman um, as a professional um, artist and as a human being. Um, and I want to thank my elders who are on this call today, thank the um, uh, tribal um, community members and leadership, and especially want to thank the family members and advocates of um, those who know these experiences all too well. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, a few things that I'm feeling as I'm listening um, and grateful to my elders here for, for um, allowing me this time to speak. 
Um, I don't want to, I want to be very careful with language. I don't think this task force is allowing me to speak. I think it is your obligation. Um, I don't think this is an opportunity. I think this is an obligation. I don't view you guys as saving us or helping us. I definitely view you guys as extending the work of centuries that has been caused specifically um, by the uh, settler colonialism on our indigenous territories. And I want to make that very clear. Um, one of the opening statements today was that uh, this administration and that um, Trump was the first president to uh, sign the MMIW task force at presidential executive order. Um, I also want to mention he is the 45th president to break tribal treaties consistently. Uh, his first act in office being the executive order to permit the Dakota Access Pipeline um, through tribal protected, sovereign, and treaty protected lands. So we have to acknowledge um, how our trust has been broken on, on several levels. Um, and I think that that's important to acknowledge that while one act might be uh, from the ongoing decades of work that Indigenous women in particular have committed to this, um, this epidemic, uh, it is um, an obligation for this administration to um, be doing this work with us. Um, one thing that comes to mind during my time that I am uh, here to speak is about consent. Consent being um, something that our society has uh, struggled with um, since the inception of the United States government. And um, I think for all of us here um, in our own histories with our own communities, we are very well aware of how consent has not been present in our daily lives, which can lead to how um, consent is uh, violated when when our people are stolen, when our people are um, becoming sex um, trafficked, and also when uh, our people are um, murdered. And I know that for me, uh, I have had to learn about consent through my own experiences of having my consent violated. I have not learned about consent from this society as a whole. I have not learned about consent in the education system and certainly have not learned about consent through the judiciary system in place. I think one recommendation is um, the importance of spreading mass awareness about consent. Also, the history of exploitation of land and bodies committed by the United States to several um, peoples and especially to indigenous peoples and the hundreds of nations that have existed here um, since time immemorial. Um, recommending that the United States um, and your administration publicly acknowledge its role in creating a culture in society that fuels these acts of violence and dehumanization, dehumanization that we experience in um, alarming and unaccepting rates. Um, I hear a lot of reactive um, suggestions, and while those are important to providing um, closure and uh, resources and help to those who are experienced in this, I think there needs to be a lot more uh, resources to be proactive in prevention of this of these learned behaviors. Um, we know that the United States government has only reached this level uh, by committing these same exact actions that have caused this crisis today, which is stealing bodies, exploiting labor, physical labor, use of violence to assure dominance and maintain power, murder and cover up. Uh, all of these have been taught in various ways to our society as a whole. And I think that um, it, it's going to require a mass acknowledgement in order for us to 
continue to heal and address why these actions are committed by our neighbors, our loved ones. Um, I think that uh, I am sure that my time is coming up soon, um, but I just want to mention uh, the importance of knowledge, acknowledging history and also in, in the importance of, of saying um, that this task force is only possible because of the um, uh, number of tribal community members, advocates, and families who have yelled and screamed and cried for this to even be a topic of discussion at the level that it is now. Um, and I personally want to thank those uh, folks in particular. Um, as a 27-year-old woman, I am watching closely how adults in society, in this country, and in your respective communities are addressing this so I can learn what to do and what not to do when, um, when the time comes that um, our generation has a, an um, obligation to handle um, these ex experiences with delicacy and with urgency. Um, again, I, I raise my hands in Kosalish um, protocol to those who are offering uh, continued sacrifice and um, value to this work. Hoi of Chad, I'm finished. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next speaker is going to be Anna Bean. Anna, we will unmute your line. Please restate your name, um, your title, as well as the name of your tribe. As a reminder, your testimony is limited to about seven to 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, your line is unmuted. You may begin offering your testimony. Anna Bean Sitsa. Um, good day, honorable friends and relatives. My name is way over there. Um, my English name is Anna Bean, and I am a member of the Piaut Tribe as well as a member of the Piaut Tribal Council. I am here today, um, as many of you are, for the I'm assuming, uh, for the same reasons, um, to honor being here, to acknowledge those who have been doing the work, as well as um, those who are um, here due to um, uh, their communities and their people being impacted by those that are missing and murdered, um, men, women, and children. Um, I, the time frame's kind of like throwing me off a little bit, but um, I do want to um, acknowledge all of those that who have been a part of this work for some period of time, and one of them um, I know is on the line is one of our own members, uh, Carolyn DeFord. Um, I've only been, to be honest with you, as many, um, was not aware of the impacts um, and the levels of what was going on with missing and murdered until about three years ago when uh, Carolyn DeFord had actually really been reaching out and bringing this to our community. Um, and and uh, as time goes, you know, from uh, one of our uh, leaders at the Piaut Tribe, they have stated, his name is David Bean, he's also my relative, has always stated that what affects one of us affects all of us, and that we often do not feel compelled to act until we are personally affected. And so I ask all of those in the room, you know, because we're trying to see and how do we get people to be engaged when they do not feel personally affected until it's hit them personally? You know, um, it's it's very frustrating um, because, you know, people may put out the red dresses or they may um, share information or they may come to a rally, but it's the, how do people, how do we engage people to stay consistent in this? Um, I don't want to, take up a lot of time, but I do know that we have, a lot of times we're speaking and you hear folks and I'm, we're talking about what we lack, um, what we're experiencing in our regions, in our states, our cities, in our reservations. Um, 
but when are we actually going to get to addressing the downfalls of whether it's the judicial system, the um, the law enforcement, all of the areas that were set in place to help all, but they're not helping. Like it's like um, when we start to report these the missing or murdered. Oftentimes, it's like a period at the end of a sentence as soon as you say it and it's done. So when are we going to actually start strategizing um, when we're going to put all of these things that we've been talking about and all of the things that we've been seeing, all the things that we've been hearing, and actually create a comprehensive strategic plan to address what has been going wrong? And are we going to create different committees who are just focused on one area and then coming back together because it shouldn't be placed on one person or one community. If we're all in this together, we all need to maybe take a stance in one area of it where something's lacking so we can correct it. Because it's, I feel like we spend a majority of the time talking about what's going wrong. And I, I appreciate those who put suggestions out there. And when are we gonna put those suggestions into action and really just bullet point and start knocking these things down to where we are seeing less and less of our own disappearing um, and really start finding people and, uh, you know, putting justice where it belongs. And that's into the hearts and homes of the families who've been affected by this most in the communities that are broken. When are we going to start healing? Um, and when it, where, where is that in this process? Um, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to speak here um, I'm, I'm thankful for all of those who spoke before. Um, my heart is heavy for anybody who is currently going through this, who's gone through this, who's been going through this. No matter the time, um, the pain is just um, as harsh and hard for each one of you that has been going through it, whether it was yesterday or years back, um, until there's justice, until um, you know you'll never feel whole and it's never going to feel right without those people here. But what can we do to ensure also that we have less and less going out? I do appreciate Kalina Lawrence mentioning like the education and being proactive as opposed to reactive. When are we going to have the left and right hands get together and start lifting our people up and finding our relatives and making our people's hearts whole? Um, I appreciate my time on the floor. Asput boot lachibi tabusa chad. Thank you all for putting this together. Um, my heart goes out to every single person who's been experiencing this in their communities. My heart is with every single person who is taking a stand and using their voice to help other folks. And um, just thank you for taking the time today. And I I, I also uh, am finished hoy of chad. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, our next speaker is going to be Carolyn DeFord. Carolyn, give us a moment. Um, we will unmute your line. As a reminder, your testimony is, um, we ask that you limit it to seven to 10 minutes. Um, please restate your name, your title, as well as, um, um, sorry, the name of your tribe. Carolyn, and your line has been unmuted. Good morning. My name is Carolyn DeFord. I am a Puyallup tribal member. My mother, Leona Kinsey, went missing in La Grande, Oregon over 20 years ago. I'm a family advocate for families of missing persons across Indian country, and I'm also a designee on behalf of my tribe, the, the Puyallup tribe, located in Tacoma, Washington, and Washington State. I'm grateful today for Operation Lady Justice and the 11 state cold case coordinators and all of the work that has been fought for to finally come into something tangible. For generations, we've been fighting to live, to be free, and to simply be Indian, and to speak our language and sing our songs. And so for that, I'm grateful to see this coming to fruition. But remember that these and the other accomplishments are not gifts in Indian country. They're things that we have fought long and hard for. I admit that I'm torn between optimism and skepticism, around Operation Lady Justice, and I'm not the only one. There's a long history of that distrust there, but I'm very hopeful as a family member, we're always holding on to some kind of hope that the system that is supposed to be in place to protect and serve will do that. 
The Puyallup tribe is one of the largest urban Indian tribes in the country. We're located um, between Portland, Oregon and the city of Seattle. We're on the I-5 corridor, which is a human trafficking hub, um, and it traffics um, indigenous people and people of all races from British Columbia to Mexico down the I-5 corridor along the west coast. Um, we struggle with the jurisdiction challenges being an urban tribe and being situated um, within a large urban setting, one of the largest cities within within Washington state. We are also fifth in the nation, according to NamUs, the database um, National Missing and Unidentified Person System, we're the fifth in the nation for missing people. And we know that data is underreported due to being voluntary, due to inaccurate accounting of race. My mother herself was, was inaccurately reported as white for 18 years. And like, um, like it, a Tyra Russell said, it, it's it's really hard to get the racial the racial classification changed. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to do that. Um, another another challenge that we're having is dealing with uh, jurisdiction over non-natives committing crimes and facing um, high rates of domestic violence and sexual abuse within our communities and and not. Hi, Carolyn. I'm sorry. Um... It looks like we lost your call. Um, are you still there? Can you hear us? Um, we need an Oliphant fix to hold to hold outsiders accountable for committing the crimes on our lands, and we need meeting, meaningful consultation and acknowledgement. Um, I don't think that the task force or that these that these tribal listening sessions had been very well advertised. Um, a lot of people that I spoke to, tribal leaders and um, community leaders and nonprofits included, had never heard of this. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done there and some tribal consultation could have probably helped in getting the word out to the folks who, who needed to be at the table. Additionally, these outside systems that are here to protect and here to work for us, they fail to honor our tribal warrants. Our protection orders and our subpoenas are often um, discarded or not taken seriously, and this fuels that distrust and the communication barriers that are already in place in an uncooperative system. Our tribal law enforcement should not have to jump through hoops to simply do the job that other law enforcement officers have to do. That there's an in inequality there that places critical timeline and, and, and deadlines and um, gaps in investigations that livelihood may be hinging on. Um, there's there's a, a sense that when we report a missing person's case or violence to law enforcement that, that something is going to be done. And I was one of those naive people, like many families, that thought that once I made that missing person's report that a detective would come in, they'd find a clue, satellite searches would happen, they'd find her car, dogs would come in, posters would be everywhere, her picture would be on the news, and people would be in, interrogated and they would, they would find her. But all I got was a call that said, let us know if you hear anything. Um, it, it, that, that's, that's crazy. This is life changing. It's been 20 years. Over the, over the period of 20 years, I've probably only received, and I'll be generous and say 15 phone calls from, from the LeGrand Police Department. Many of those were return calls to my own, to my own inquiries. Um, I, I will give, give some credit to her, her current detective and a couple in the past who did, um, fulfill their obligations to returning my calls and doing those things, but it was always the bare minimum, and, and to me it still is. I have had contact with um, one of the cold case coordinators for Oregon State, and so I'm hopeful that there will be some action in my mom's case there. But there were a lot of times where the ball was dropped, and like others have said, once they become a cold case, then what happens? There's no resources for cold cases. She's always on the back burner because there's always something more important. And so now my mom is a is an urban legend in her town, in her hometown, that this is what happens if you do this. Um, that's not her legacy. She she was fierce and she was strong and she was a hunter and a gatherer and she told stories and was a teacher and now she's an urban legend about what happens if you do these things in my community. Um, in 2018, I assisted a family whose sister had been missing for over 12 years and they didn't have a police report yet. 
They had tried several times to make the report, but were told that since she was over 18, she had the right to no contact. At one time, law enforcement even told them that the report would be made. Um, after so long of being told that, you kind of think, well, maybe that's the way the system is, you know, and um, after 12 years, we were finally able to get her report made, get some DNA taken, and get a report in the system for her, yet the system still failed. The people who took the report didn't have jurisdiction to take it and wouldn't reach out to the jurisdiction, the agency with the jurisdiction. We had to do that. The agency who had jurisdiction wouldn't take her report unless we drove three hours in the middle of winter to come do it personally. They wouldn't take it from the outside agency that was still within the same state. Once we finally were able to contact them and they agreed to take the report, it was still there was still a lot of attitude and innuendos in the conversation, and it's not necessarily what was said, it was how it was said. Um, finally, one of the detectives out of, out of um, Snohomish County took the report because there was an unidentified person in her area that matched that description. Families should not be having to fight that fight and search through NamUs through unidentified person's report, trying to make a connection on their missing person, on their loved one, looking at dead remains of, of, of pictures in, in databases that are triggering and not have the support systems there to help process that. It's, it's a hard and painful um, journey and the system is failing in every level. Simply in updating families and giving the courtesy when the detective changes, updating families as to um, what is needed and what the next steps are. I get a postcard from my vet every month to give my dog shots so that she's ready for updates for things, but I don't get about where they are with her case or what has happened or, or anything. Um, and I'm not the only one going through those challenges. We need, we need more. We, we can't have this talk and no action. There are communities who are doing good work. There's a lot of amazing work being done in New Mexico right now. And, and um, a lot of tribes are, are making changes to increase the protective factors and start with prevention work and address these issues from the ground up. But we need the resources to be able to do that. We need long-term sustainable resources to be able to do that. As far as Indian country um, being lacking the access to do those things, that's just part of it. Not only do I lack the access, but when I make that phone call, I'm being judged. If I'm calling an outside agency, they're judging the way I talk. They're judging my language, the way I look. They're judging my, my mental health. They're judging uh, my family and the way I live. And they're judging my intelligence and my integrity. So I'm already coming in that from an under from from an understanding that that my case isn't going to be taken seriously, me and my mom isn't going to be taken seriously, and that she's just another Indian who another drunk Indian, and um, she's more than that. Indian country holds a timeless and irreplaceable place in our nation, and I want you to remember that by bearing witness to our heartfelt testimonies, this comes with a deep obligation and a moral duty to honor them and do good works, to honor our sovereignty, to support us in resolving these issues, to support us in resolving these issues. We have the answers to our problems, and you can only you can only heal indigenous wounds and indigenous trauma with indigenous healing and indigenous medicine. It can't be mainstream. It has to come from us. Um, we need strong and strict, meaningful consultation for these, for these events, for these calls, and for the healing and for the work and the decisions that are going to be made from this task force. Um, only, only we understand the implications and what has to happen. And so I hope that you hold that safe, hold that in your heart. And my prayers are that every one of you hears these words, that it rings true, and that you have the heart condition and the mindset to do the good work that has to be done to honor our families and bring them home. Again, my name is Carolyn D. Ford. My mother is Leona Lee Claire Kinsey. Thank you. Carolyn, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, at this time, we do not have any other speakers that we are able to identify, 
we are going to unmute the call lines again and um, we'll go through and call out your name. Um, give us a moment to unmute those lines. If you are on the call, then you will be able to, um, to speak. So one second, please, while we get those lines unmuted. Um, we are looking for Chrissy Strong, or Sissy Strong, Desiree Rohad, Josie Tenorio, Tenor, Tenor, Tenorio, Tara Pretend Eagle Weber, Jennifer Burskin, Dalia, Roxanne White, Benita Moore, Rachel Fernandez, Kyle Taylor Lucas, Felicia Laika, Billy Miller. So if any of you are on the call, your line has been unmuted and you may begin your testimony. I'll give you a moment to respond. All right, at this time, it does, doesn't appear that we have any other um, individuals prepared to offer testimony that are on the call. Um, Tara, I will send it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Lidos for um, moderating this final session for uh, the Operation Lady Justice uh, Tribal Consultation. I want to thank the task force members uh, that have participated throughout this entire process. Uh, on behalf of the task force, I, I will say that um, I have appreciated the time to listen and to learn, uh, to hear the concerns that are being raised, the, uh, the pleas for um, more effective government involvement uh, the, the requests for continued assistance and guidance uh, throughout the country. You know, we have heard also um, the need for clarity for victims and uh, families of victims, uh, improved processes. And so all of the information that is being shared uh, throughout the listening sessions and the virtual tribal consultations will help guide our internal discussions as we prepare for uh, a status report that we are uh, required to submit to the president in November. And then uh, as we continue to move forward with the work in 2021, uh, with our final uh, recommendations to the president. For those who are listening and have not uh, provided oral testimony, verbal testimony, uh, I would encourage you to consider uh, submitting written comments. Uh, we have a comment period that is open, and it will be open until September 30th. Uh, you can submit your comments uh, directly to the Operation Lady Justice uh, Office, uh, the, to the Executive Director, that's Marcia Good, and that email address is OperationLadyJustice at USDOJ, as in justice, dot gov. In addition to the email, I would encourage uh, the listening audience to also visit the website. You can subscribe to the website to receive email updates and additional information about the task force uh, or any events that are coming up uh, on the horizon. Uh, the website address is Operation Lady Justice at usdoj.gov. And again, before uh, we close, I just, I would like to also um, repeat that I am humbled by the testimony that has been provided uh, throughout the consultations. Uh, I've talked to some of you that I heard today uh, about the various challenges in your communities, and uh, I personally appreciate the continued advocacy 
uh, and the desire to help us do better. Uh, and so with that, I wish you all um, well and to have um, good health and, and to be safe in these uncertain times. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes today's consultation.